technology is changing the world. I wanted to point out a few things that the rate of change that we are facing today is the fastest that mankind has ever seen. The last time we had this speed of innovation and change was probably the steam age. And one side effect of that, which is very fascinating as a banker, is that if you go back to 1965, the average company survived for 40 years, and we'll come back to that vis-a-vis -vis Sri Lanka in a minute, that is down to only 14 years in 2022. If I came to you 10 years ago and said that GE would be kicked out of the Dow Jones Industrial Index by a small company rating restaurants in San Francisco, you would have laughed at me. Well, GE is out of the index uh, and <laughs> Travel City is in. So you're seeing a, a rate of change of market caps of investment that the world has not seen before. And just at the bottom here, you can see some of the companies that have left the index in the last few years. So 50% of the S&P 500 will be replaced in the next 10 years. And that's something that when we're talking to investors, they are very, very aware of and very concerned about. Uh, as tech disruption hits, one interesting factoid is that the disruption always starts slow and then massively accelerates. So I wanted to give you a few examples here. One of my favorite ones is travel. Travel agencies today make less than 40% of what they made five years ago. It's not because you're all traveling less. It's because everything gets booked on Expedia or C-Trip. I was with the CEO of C-Trip in China last week, and she was telling me that she now books 50% of all travel of Chinese people in the world. 50% with a one single uh, with one single company, she's booking 300 million airline tickets a year at the moment. An absolutely phenomenal number. If you then put up any traditional company, one thing that is completely different is the rate of competition that they're getting from startups and smaller companies in the world. So we put up FedEx here. I, I could have put up Citibank, although my CEO would have been mad with me if I had done that. But if you take FedEx as an example, you have lots and lots of small companies attacking the products that they do, which is something that we've never seen before. And the reason that this is possible, and we'll talk a little bit about the cloud enables this, but in the past, FedEx could watch a company grow from one city to two cities to three cities. They could choose to poach their staff. They could choose to crush them. They could buy them at some point. Now I'll give you one example. In Hong Kong, there's a small company called GoGoVan, and GoGoVan does 60% of all the intra-Hong Kong volumes now, and it's run by two 26-year-olds, and the company didn't exist a few years ago. So how did those two 26-year-olds do it? They basically did it because the cost of starting up a business is smaller than ever before. So for $5,000, you could go to Google or Microsoft, get something hosted in the cloud, go to WeWork, get a cheap office space, and you can have the infrastructure of a large company uh, <clears throat> in less than a year, and you can have it at a cost that only a few years ago would have cost tens of millions of dollars. In fact, one of my favorite examples is, is a big client of ours called Oak North Bank. Oak North Bank is the first bank in 100 years to get a full UK banking license. And where I'm, I'm quite impressed with them is they got their license, um, went to dinner and celebrated, and then the next day they went to the regulators and said, we hate UK banking regulation, <laughs> which the regulator was really shocked by because they're used to dealing with Barclays or Citibank or we have a gentleman from Standard Chartered here. All of us are so traumatized by the regulators. We always, can we make you another cup of coffee? Do you want to do another audit? We would love another audit. Please come. And, so, and then this guy shows up and says, I hate your rules. Um, and what he, what, the reason he could do it is he didn't have operations yet. And the point he was making is, I don't want to adhere to the IT rules. I want to put the entire bank on Amazon Web Services. And what the regulator did, they actually listened, allowed him to do it. If he had stuck to the old rules, the minimum cost to open on day one would have been $50 million. Because he would have needed two data centers, 50 miles apart, X recovery sites. 
his opening cost was $50,000. So a fraction of what it would cost. A lot of people can find $50,000. It's very hard to find 50 million. So that's a, a very interesting development which will reverberate through uh, financial technology for a long time. The one trend that is then happening is everything we do is gonna become as a service. You may be the last generation that's allowed to get a driving license, but this is, is happening all over the world. And one of the things which is really fascinating to me is how people are sharing all kinds of things. In China, we are financing uh, apartment builders who are making apartments that are literally this big. They got a double bed for a young couple, they got a shower, and they got a toilet. They have no living room, they have no kitchen, and what's really interesting about that particular lifestyle is when this couple wants to entertain their friends, they can book on their phone a beautiful, huge living room kitchen combo at the top of the complex, and in there, uh, they can invite their friends over, they can have a nice meal, they can cook for them, they can get drunk, but they don't need to own the cooker, they don't need to own the, the table, they don't need to own the chairs. And rightly or wrongly, if you go speak to the average people in China and you say, how often did you formally entertain at home in the last year? The, the answer in all of Asia, with the exception of, of Sri Lanka and Australia, <laughs> is about four times a year. So, uh, so in Australia, the answer is about 16 times a year. In Sri Lanka, it's every weekend. So I want to come back home. I don't, I'm, I'm in the four times a year category right now. Um, what is fascinating to me, um, and I, I don't want to take away anything from the great stuff many of the, the companies have done in the world, but in reality, this boost of disruption has included not that much hardcore tech innovation. Now, what do I mean by that? If you look at a company like Uber, they didn't have to invent the GPS chip that was put in the phones courtesy of Apple and Samsung. The maps came from Google in the beginning. The database, I don't know, probably Oracle or something like that. They integrated it very well. And then they had huge amounts of courage in terms of rolling it out, and I'll explain that in a minute and they had vast amounts of cash. And what do I mean by courage? Maybe in Uber's case, in Uber's case, they were criminally illegal everywhere where they launched and even ended up in jail in some cases. So in China, they went to jail for a weekend, in Korea for a year and a half, and in France, six weeks. <laughs> I'll take a quiz later which of those three you would pick. I'm personally picking France. Um, so, this is important to realize because we're about to enter a phase where companies like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, others will bring very hardcore tech innovation in particular around AI and if anything, that will increase the rate of innovation. Um, so I think the speed will even go faster. Um, investors as a result, I think irrational is a strong word here. I, I, I maybe should edit that out, but are moving huge flows of capital. So if you look at Topopedia uh, in Indonesia, it has gotten an investment of $1.1 billion. Topopedia was a small e-commerce site in Indonesia that was making only $10 million revenue on their platform and the first check they got was $250 million. That is a movement of capital Indonesia had never seen before. Didi got $1.6 billion to invest in self-driving cars. Geo in, in India actually... Um, the Reliance Group invested $30 billion into GEO. So you can see huge amounts of investment flowing into these companies. Um, now, one of the reasons that this investment is flowing so quickly, I'm just giving a quick look on the time here, is that the opportunity for disruption is so, so, so large. So Alibaba today is turning over a trillion dollars of revenue on its platforms, a trillion dollars. What, what's the GDP of Sri Lanka now? 90 billion, so 10 Sri Lankas in one company. That is absolutely an insane amount of revenue in one company. Now, when we were very lucky a city to have worked on the IPO of, uh, of Alibaba. When we took them public, 
Alibaba had 30 square centimeters, maybe this much of retail space per capita, whereas the United States had two and a half square meters. So all of this space per capita retail space. Now, what that means is that in America, you had many, many choices, which is why it took a long time for Amazon to grow the way it did. In China, there was no choice. So it grew much quicker in China. And this is a very important lesson for Sri Lanka because this leapfrogging will occur here as well in many facets. And this leapfrogging is happening all over China with all kinds of products. So one of my favorite examples of this is Ping An Good Doctor. I, I don't know if, if you realize this, uh, Ping An Good Doctor does phone consultations for patients. Now in China, what many people don't realize, outside Shanghai and Beijing, there are no uh, family doctors at all. So if your grandma gets ill, you have two choices. You can take it to the pharmacy, or you can take her to the emergency room. So there are somewhere around 9 billion hospital visits a year just because people don't have a doctor to go to. Ping Ango Doctor is offering a phone consultation service and they're already doing half a million calls a day. And the amazing thing about that is, and this is the very interesting thing, is the service that Ping Ango Doctor is offering is much better than anything a Western doctor could deliver. And here's, here's why. If you go to a doctor in Germany and you walk in, very friendly gentleman maybe, 65 years old, hasn't seen a medical textbook since 1973. Who knows if he's kept himself up to date. He's in a rush to get you out because he's got a whole waiting room of people waiting. So he's chunking you in and out. Ping Ango doctor uh, gets on the phone with you and it's text-based initially. Um, and what you don't know is you're talking to a robot. And the robot has time. So the robot goes, oh, I'm so sorry, and you got a tummy ache. Uh, well, since when have you had the tummy ache? And you go, oh, I've had the tummy since Saturday. Oh, no, that's already two days. What were you doing on Friday? Ah, I went to play golf. Oh, where did you play golf? And chat and chat and find out it was hot. I didn't drink. I had beers at lunch, all kinds of stupid behavior. And it can do that for 30, 40 minutes. And I think, wow, this person really cares about me. Talking about my golf game, whether it was hot, have I had a fight with my wife? And then um, a real doctor comes on. And this is largely for legal reasons, because in China, you can't yet give advice in an automated way. And that doctor sees a summary of all of the symptoms and sees... A grading, most likely it's just dehydration, second is this, tiny chance it's that, and then can make up his or her own mind and deliver the service. And then when the final diagnosis is done, the medicine comes around on a motorcycle and it's there in 30 minutes. So you haven't had to leave the home. The medicine arrives on a motorcycle. So this service is so superior to anything in the West that it's growing in China out of a need, but it will come to the West because it's superior. So this is a really interesting thing. We estimate that Asia, and China in particular, is, uh, is 12 years ahead of the rest of the world. So it's an interesting place to watch what will happen. Now, about Sri Lanka, and, and we should put Citibank up here because we have been in Sri Lanka for 40 years and we are very proud of that. And uh, Ravin is going to be organizing a, a big birthday party for us. And I, I hope all of you come to this. Um, so one thing I did want to point out, if you look at the companies in Sri Lanka that we're very proud of, they have huge esteemed histories. Cargill's 1884. Um, you can even see the Commercial Bank of Sri Lanka. It's here since 1920. In many countries like Sri Lanka, the industrial landscape changes very slowly historically. It takes a long, long time. The same was true in Indonesia. Now in Indonesia, four of the top 10 most valuable companies in Indonesia did not exist five years ago. So the rate of change when it comes can be phenomenally rapid. And so one important lesson for these esteemed older companies is to change yourselves very quickly or to partner or to learn from. And the one interesting thing is Sri Lanka because it's a relatively small country. It's, it's smaller than Shanghai, actually. Um, you, 
the, the investments are not yet coming. But as Indonesia gets rolled out, as India gets rolled out, at some point, meaningful movements of capital will come here as well and, uh, and disrupt Sri Lanka in a meaningful way. All right, that was my 15 minutes. It's very nice to talk to you. I'm going to hand over to the next speaker.